Okay, kids, so we're back here, section 3.2, and we want to take a look at the role of forces during uniform circular motion. Just so, just so you remember, uniform circular motion, you've got an object with a velocity v, and that velocity continually changes. It's always a tangent to the circumference, and the acceleration of the object as it undergoes uniform circular motion is always towards the center anywhere that it is, this object moving in a circle. So I want you to remember, you know, the most important equation in physics, F net equals MA, or um, the sum of all forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. But in this particular case, the acceleration is centripetal acceleration. So there has to be a force or forces that add to give you F net that produce this centripetal acceleration. Sometimes it's tension, as I've mentioned before, uh, a mass at the end of a string being twirled around. Sometimes it's a force of gravity, universal gravitation. For example, the Earth going around uh, the sun. Sometimes it's normal force. Sometimes it's force of friction, specifically force of static friction. And we're going to look at our first example of forces and how they are important for studying uniform circular motion. And our first example, will involve the force of static friction. So here we have the situation where I, we saw something like this before, a circular track. Here's the top view and there's a car and the car is going to go around in a circle and it's going to be uh, most definitely uniform circular motion for this car. All right. And the one thing that we have to understand that if it has uniform circular motion, there's the center. I can draw it on a side view as well. This is the side view, top view, side view. There's the center, right? This distance is the radius that the car is moving along with as it goes around the circle. Now, if it's going to be uniform circular motion, it has to be a circle that has a constant radius. So that radius will not change. That radius will not change. And we now want to draw a free body diagram for this object, the car. Now, I suggest you pause the video and then try it yourself and then watch what the answer is. So pause the video. Okay, so we're back. I hope you paused the video. I was watching. All right, so I hope you realize it's on a surface. There's a normal force. And I hope you realize that there was the force of gravity. But when this car is here, we know that the centripetal acceleration is in the direction towards the center. So since the centripetal acceleration is towards the center, there has to be a net force towards the center. So these two added up together won't produce anything that's towards the circle center. So the thing that's keeping the car from staying at this constant radius is friction. Now you might think it's kinetic friction, but it's actually static friction because the car never slips out or slips in along the radial direction. It has a constant radius. So there's no motion in this direction. So it's static friction from the tires on the road that keeps the car with this radius that doesn't change. If there's not enough st static friction, the car will slide out. We need static friction to keep uniform circular motion. So let's do a question based upon that. So here is um, a question. A thousand kilogram car undergoes uniform circular motion on a flat track with a radius of 50 meters, so the radius in the question we're doing, and radius is right here, is 50 meters. The car goes around 
So let, notice I use the word speed, not velocity, okay? Because the, the direction is continually changing. So it goes around the circle at 14 meters per second. Will the car make the turn, meaning will it stay on track in a nice circle, constant radius, uniform circular motion, or will it slide out? That's what we need to calculate. Okay, that's what we need to calculate. So, like other questions, we're, we're going to write our given, and the mass, 1,000 kilograms, radius, 50 meters, there you go, speed, notice it's not a vector, 14.0 meters per second, and we'll draw, we'll redraw the free body diagram. There it is, static friction, keeps it from sliding out, hopefully. And uh, we have to figure out what are we trying to calculate, right? What are we trying to calculate? Well, we're trying to calculate if this speed, if this speed, V, is possible. Now, we need to find out what type of track we have here. Well, I'm going to say we have two types of track. We have a dry track, and when the track is dry, mu s is 0 0.6. Remember the coefficient of frictions? When the track is icy or wet, mu s is 0 0.2. Oh, so we want to find out if we can achieve that speed with these different coefficients of friction. Okay, so as always, it's a dynamics problem. We're going to start with Newton's second law, F net equals MA. In this case, the forces are the normal force, the force of gravity, and the force of static friction, and it equals mass times acceleration. It's just that in this particular situation, the acceleration is centripetal acceleration. Now, I think you can tell from the free body diagram and the fact that the surface is flat, right? This is a special situation, very similar to things we saw in grade 11, that these two, the normal force and the force of gravity, cancel out. So we have, oopsie, Force of static friction is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, what I suggest that you do here, we've done this technique before, is that you know that the centripetal acceleration is always towards the center. So let that direction be positive, right? Let that direction be positive and then drop the vector signs, put the plus sign out in front of that, it'll give you the direction, and then you can just write AC no vector sign, okay? AC uh, no vector sign. So, this we know is equal to the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration, which we learned a while ago was V squared over R. We did a whole derivation for that. V squared over R. And now we're going to substitute and we're going to get force and triple the mass is 1,000 kilograms. It was moving at 14 meters per second. That was the speed. That's better. Meters per second. Don't forget, you have to square it. And then we have uh, the radius, I believe, was 50 meters. So pause the video, put that in your calculator, see what answer you get. I'll be right back with you.
So I, uh, I hope you got an answer there, and uh, I hope your answer is 3,000. That's a horrible three. That's better. Oh, Lord. Let me try to do that better. Sometimes this thing doesn't work properly. 3,900 newtons. Okay, so that is how much static friction is needed for moving with this car at that radius and that speed. So this is what we call how much we need. But how much is actually there? How much is actually there? Well, let's figure out when it's icy. When it's icy, you may recall the equation for the magnitude of the force of static friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the magnitude of the normal force, which then becomes negative force of gravity because they're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. And we remember that the force of gravity is the mass of the object times the gravitational field strength near the surface of the Earth. That's when it's icy. What about when it's dry? It's the same equation. Whether or not it's spelled dry. It's the same equation. Okay. So if it's icy or dry, it's the same equation. The only thing that changes is mu s. That's the only thing that changes. So when it's dry, mu s is 0 0.60. This would be a thousand kilograms and put a bracket there. A nice bracket here, nice bracket there. This is negative 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Close the bracket, all within absolute values. When it's icy, when it's icy, it's not 0 0.60, it's 0 0.20, right? The rest is the same. It's still the same car. So we're going to put that in there. And then we're going to substitute in some values. We're going to substitute in some values here. And um, when it's icy, when it's icy, we get 1,900 newtons. When it's dry, we get 5,900 newtons. So this is how much you actually have in these different situations. So now you got to compare what you have to what is needed. This is what you need to make the curve. Well, if it's dry out, you got more than enough uh, force of static friction. You got 5,900, all you need is 3,900. You're gonna make the curve. When it's icy, you have 1,900. That's all the friction you're gonna get out of the surface. Look. You need 3,900. You will not make the curve. Aha. Okay, so uh, the next example is a banked curve. So instead of the curve being flat, right? Instead of the curve being flat, it's at an angle. You see this on on-ramps, um, off-ramps. You see it on racing tracks. The curve is banked. It's at an angle, right? It's at an angle. The curve is not flat. This is really helpful for making turns in a short amount of space. You don't want to have an on-ramp that goes on for kilometers, right? So let's let's take a closer look at this. Let's take a closer look at this and see how it's related to uniform circular motion.
because usually the ramp, you have a car on the ramp, right? So there's the car on the ramp, and it's going around in a circular path, or at least a portion of a circle, right? It's going around in a circle here. And usually you try to keep a constant speed. So if you can think about way out here somewhere, let me draw a different color, way out here somewhere is the center of the circle for which the car is traveling. So if I were to draw it here, here's let's say this is the center of the car. So way out here, this is the radius, way out here floating in the air would be the center of the circle with which this car is traveling in this circular motion. So we want to, we want to see uh, all the ramifications of this by using our knowledge of uniform circular motion. So here's my, here, here's the like simplified version of the ramp. And what we're looking here is we, we can only draw a two dimensional drawing. So this is a cross section of what's happening. Definitely a cross section. We can't draw the whole curve. We're only gonna draw what happens at a, an instant in time. So uh, let's draw where the car is. Maybe here's the car. We'll let this represent the car. And uh, let's draw some forces on it. Well, th there's a surface here. The road, the track is a surface. And 90 degrees to that surface, you're going to have the normal force. And, well, you know, we're on the Earth. So since we're on the Earth, there's a force of gravity acting on the object. Now, we need to remember that this car is moving in a circle and as it's moving in a circle, there's a radius to it. This is not a force, this is just a radius to it. So the car's circular motion has its center way up here. Some kids want to put the center here. It's not moving with its center here. If, if its center was here, at some point it'd have to be in the ground. Remember, here, here's the rest of the ground right here. Right, here's the rest of the ground. It's not moving in a circle that is above the ground then below the ground. It's not, it's here. It's moving in a circle up here on a, some type of track or something. So that's where the center is. So because of that, we know that this is the direction of centripetal acceleration. That's what centripetal acceleration means. And we know that the distance from where the car is to the center is the radius. We know that. Now, since this is the direction of the centripetal acceleration, when you pick your coordinate system, when you pick your coordinate system, you want to pick a coordinate system that's convenient. Well, a convenient coordinate system would be this. Y hat, X hat. With positive X hat always being in the direction of the centripetal acceleration. That's what brings us convenience. That's what brings us convenience. So, we've got this car uh, moving here, and what we want to find out is, and if some of you may be going into civil engineering, you design on ramps, on ramps and off ramps, right? What would be a proper angle to keep a car on track here, even if it's icy and you have no friction? Because you got to think about the winter. How much banking, what's the angle that you would need to keep a car safely here, even on a slippery day, right, when it's going at an appropriate speed? Now, if you try to take the banked curb at 150 kilometers an hour and it's icy out, well, good luck to you. Uh, you know, what's the appropriate angle for a reasonable driver, right? What's the angle there for a reasonable driver? So if you were, a, a, you know, a civil engineer, you would have to find out what is that angle that I need. And I only have so much real estate. I only have so much land. So the radius can only be so big. 
I can't have a radius on an on-ramp or off-ramp that takes up a football field uh, width or more. Right? There's only so much space, right? There's farmland, there's side roads, there's service roads. You need to tuck this on-ramp, off-ramp in this little sliver. So your, your radius is usually going to be defined by how much space you have. So that leaves a civil engineer, well, what angle do I need then? What angle do I need to keep this these cars on the road? Well, at the end of the day, kids, uh, this becomes a dynamics problem. This becomes a dynamics problem with uh, a situation where you have to say, F net, that's how we start dynamics problems. The X component is equal to mass times acceleration, X component of the acceleration, F net, Y component is equal to mass times the acceleration, Y component. Okay. So if we're going to do that, we've got to look at these forces here, and there's only two of them, normal force and force of gravity, and see if any of them need to be broken down into X and Y components. Well, force of gravity is all negative Y hat. That's easy. What about normal force? Is it all in the X direction or all in the Y direction? No, it's not. So we got to break this down into into the components. So you need to find normal force. X component, as odd as that sounds, and normal force Y component. We've got to break that down. So we need to find out what is happening with the angles in here. Luckily, it's a banked curve, and this is 90 degrees, and this is 90 degrees here as well. So that means if we've got theta here, this will be phi, the complementary angle there. Then if you take a look here, here and here, that's also 90 degrees. So that means that's theta right there. That is theta right there. And if you take a look here, let me get another color here, along this line and this line, that's also 90 degrees. So that means if I got theta in here and the whole thing is 90, I got to have phi right in here. And then I got 90 degrees in here, so that means that's theta. And that all came from our knowledge of the fact that a triangle has 180 degrees, and if one of the angles is 90, the other two have to add up to the other 90. The phi and the theta have to add up to the other 90. So now I can start to break down, I can start to break down the normal force into its x hat and y hat components using the angles that we have. So Let's, th let's stick with theta, okay? Let, let's stick with theta. It's the angle that we've been given in the banking curve. It's we, what we want to calculate. So, x component. The x component is right here. The x component is right here. It is opposite to the theta. So, if we take a look at this here, we can say, well, the, the normal force x component is in the positive x direction and it's the only force in the x direction and it's going to equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Well the acceleration in the x direction that's the direction of centripetal acceleration so this becomes centripetal acceleration and notice we drop the vector signs and we put in the direction from the free body diagram. Then over here you'd have positive normal force y component because that's positive direction and over we'd also have uh, force of gravity oops made a mistake there 
force of gravity is definitely downward. Remember, we're dropping the vector notation. And that is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Now, you got to ask yourself, is this object moving up or down? No, it's not. It's sticking there. It's undergoing uniform circular motion. It's not sliding up or falling down. It's sticking there. So there's no motion in the y direction. So this is zero. So now, as I was saying before, normal force x component, right? This is opposite to the theta. So it becomes normal force sine theta, we get its direction, that's a horrible theta, we get its direction from the free body diagram is equal to m, well that's centripetal acceleration, I know its magnitude, m v squared over r. Over here, this will become positive, well, look, the normal force y component is definitely in the positive y hat direction so it's positive but it's adjacent it's adjacent to the theta so it becomes normal force cos theta minus m g equals zero take a pause and let that sink in for a while okay i hope you uh, let that sink in I'm just going to do a little bit of algebra here and bring the mass times gravity to the other side so it becomes positive. And now I'm in a position to name these equations. I'm going to call this equation here number one, and I'm going to call this equation here number two. So we've got a system of two equations here. And remember, we want to solve for theta. We want to solve for theta. So uh, usually what you're given when you do these problems is if you're a civil engineer, right, you'd be given the uh, how fast the cars usually go, what's the radius that you have available, right? You'd be given those right there, okay? Uh, you're usually not really worried about mass because you might have a little car, a big truck, so mass really shouldn't be part of this, right? But you've got this normal force as an other term here. So it would be really nice if you could eliminate it. That way you could stick to your known quantities. So the way we do that is we take the first equation and we literally divide it by the second equation. I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's just taking one equation and making a fraction out of it. So here's our fraction line, equation one divided by equation two. And let's take a look at this. Is there anything we can cancel? Well, yeah, well, that cancels out, right? That cancels out right there. Mass cancels out. That's great. So we're left with sine theta over cos theta. Well, I hope you realize that's tan theta from math class. And over here, we would have uh, v squared over r all divided by g. Well, dividing by g, right, is the same as multiplying by the inverse, 1 over g. So you'd get this right here. If you need to work that out, pause the video and see how that comes about. So then theta, which is what we want to find, would be tan inverse of v squared all over rg. So if you want to post the speed limit on your ramp, you know the radius of the ramp, you know what planet you're on, look, it doesn't matter what the mass of the uh, vehicle is. It could be a little car or a big truck. That's good. That makes life easier if you're designing an on-ramp or on-ramp, off-ramp. So you can find the appropriate angle that's needed for a posted speed limit and, you know, how much room 
do we have to build this on ramp? So there's your second example of using uh, uniform circular motion, right? V, uh, v squared over R, right? And forces and how they come together and their implications. We'll do some more examples. So here's an, another one, kids, another classic example. It's uni vertical uniform circular motion. So it's someone with a stone, right? Someone with a stone, here's a stone, and it's twirling around, vertical circle. So here would be the top. Here uh, would be when the stone is in the middle of its vertical circle. And here it would be at the bottom. And what we really want to find out, what we what's required to find here is, is how does the tension change as this goes around and around in a circle? So like many of these problems, we're dealing with forces at the end of the day, if you're going to figure out what's happening with tension, which is a force, it's all about Newton's second law. F net equals MA. So the three key spots are the top, the middle, and the bottom. Anywhere in between top, middle, and bottom is just combinations of them. So what you really want to do is draw a free body diagram for each situation. That's what you want to do. Draw a free body diagram in each situation. So I, I suggest you pause the video, pause the video, and then uh, come back and then compare what you got to what we're going to talk about. Okay, so pause the video. All right, so we're back. So at the top, I, I hope you got the fact that at the top, there's the force of gravity acting on the object. And since it's at the top here, the string will be here, right? And the string is pulling down the tension, with uh, the stone with tension. So we're going to call that tension. There it is, right there. And that's it. Those are the only two forces right there. How about in the middle? Okay. Well, here it is. The stone's in the middle here. Now the tension is this way, right? So you've got tension here, and force of gravity doesn't change. Now you're down at the bottom, so the string is here. Well, if the string is here, the tension's going to be this way. So we're going to draw a free body diagram here. Now the tension is straight up. Well, that's not a very good straight up arrow, is it? Let me see if I can fix that. There. Better. Tension straight up, a force of gravity down. So give your chance to think, uh, give your, uh, yourself a chance to think about this. Just think about it for a second. Pause the video. All right. So hopefully figure that out. The other thing I'm going to suggest you do is to get a sense of direction. To make direction convenient, look where the direction of the centripetal acceleration is. When you're at the top, the direction of centripetal acceleration is that way. Make that the positive direction. Here, it's at the middle. The direction of centripetal acceleration is that way. Make that positive. Here, it's at the bottom. The dire direction of centripetal acceleration is up. Make that positive. So in each of these, you're going to have a different direction that's positive. But is it really different? Well, it's always towards the center, which is really at the key of understanding uniform circular motion, that the centripetal acceleration is always towards the center. So then, we're going to continue. We're going to say F net equals MA for each of these for each of them, right? And here, we've got uh, at the top, the force of gravity is in the positive direction. So I'm going to drop the vector notation here and just say, look, it's in the di same direction as centripetal acceleration. That's positive. And tension is as well. 
and that is centripetal acceleration. That's what the acceleration is. Here, this tension is in the direction of the centripetal acceleration, right? And so I'm going to drop the vector notation, put positive there, and that is equal to mass times centripetal acceleration. You may be wondering, well, what happened to the force of gravity? It's in a completely different component. It's 90 degrees to all of this. It's not going to come into this equation. And over here, F net equals MA, look at the direction of the centripetal accelerations towards the center of the circle when you're at the bottom. Well, that means tension is in that direction, but force of gravity is in the opposite direction. Aha! And that is mass times centripetal acceleration. So here, the tension would equal the mass of the stone, right? Multiplied by how fast it's going squared all over the radius. Here, we got to do some work. It's mv squared over r, but I'm bringing this force of gravity over to the other side. Minus force of gravity. Or if you really want to get fancy, mv squared over r minus mg. Notice there's no vectors. I made a boo-boo there. Let's fix that. No vector notation. We've already got the direction set from the free body diagram. Here, mv squared over r. I got to bring this force of gravity over the other side. becomes positive. So we get mv squared over r plus mg. Well, if you take a look, this has the greatest value because you're adding these two terms. And it kind of makes sense that the tension is strongest at the bottom because not only is tension keeping the stone in its uniform circular motion, but tension is also working directly against gravity. Here, the tension is the smallest. Why? Well, tension is getting some help. Tension is getting some help from gravity to cause the centripetal acceleration because they're both acting in the direction of centripetal acceleration. You don't need as much tension as the top of at the top of the twirl of the um, circular spin here because gravity is already pulling it down towards the center. So here the tension is at the lowest. So if you maintain the radius, right, you maintain the radius, and you maintain the speed during the entire circular motion, the tension will be smallest at the top, biggest at the bottom, and everywhere else it will be somewhere in between. This is another classic, classic example. We'll do one more. Okay, kids, so uh, the next classic example of uniform circular motion and the forces that cause it is the conical pendulum. So here's a string and there's a mass at the end of it and it's moving through a circular motion and the circle is horizontal. So if you think about it, if we extend this line here, this would be the center of this circle. And then there would be the radius as this object undergoes uniform circular motion. And it would be moving through with a certain speed around the circle. So once again, because a lot of kids want to think that the length here, the length of this pendulum, that, that is the radius of the motion. It's not. There's the center. There's the radius. And usually, as we've done here, we define a theta in there, and we define a theta right in there. So this is the classical conical pendulum. Why is it called a conical pendulum? Well, it's got the word cone in here. So if you, in your mind you picture this line here sweeping through, right? It would sweep through as a cone. Here's the bottom of the cone. Here's the top of the cone, right? 
picture this line all the way around, and then you put the ice cream right here in the big end. That's why it's called a conical pendulum. It sweeps out the, the shape of a cone. So not always, but usually in these questions, but not always, they want you to find out, well, what's the angle here? If you've got a certain length of a string, right? What's the angle here if you've got a certain length of a string and it's moving with a certain speed? What's the angle going to be? That's usually what they ask you. Not always, but usually. So what we have to do is draw a free body diagram here. we got to draw a free body diagram. What are the forces acting on this pendulum? Well, on the mass there. Well, there's the force of gravity. Right? There's the tension force, which is at an angle. Okay, there's the tension force, which is at an angle. Now, we're going to keep the standard x hat y hat coordinate system. So, since you've got this tension at an angle and we've got a two-dimensional motion here, you've got to break the tension down into tension x hat, all right, and tension y hat. Now, the other thing you got to remember is What's the direction of the centripetal acceleration? Well, the direction of centripetal acceleration in this free body diagram, centripetal acceleration would be in that direction, right? It's towards the center. So as odd as this may look, as odd as this may look, and it doesn't, I mean, if we had the, the mass on the other side, this wouldn't happen. But regardless, make this direction, the direction of centripetal acceleration, make that your positive x hat direction. It's just so convenient. No matter where the object is in your mind when you're solving this, it's always been to be towards the center. So if the centripetal acceleration is towards center, let that be your positive x. Okay, let that be your positive x. It just, oops, what did I just do there? I have no idea. So Well, this is a dynamics problem, kids, right? It's a dynamics problem. So we've got to start with Newton's second law. And it's two-dimensional. How many times do we start problems with Newton's second law? All the time. Okay. So x direction. Well, the only force in the x direction here is tension x, and it's towards the center. It's in the direction of centripetal acceleration, so we're going to make that positive. And acceleration x is centripetal acceleration. Over here, we've got positive tension y, right? Positive direction minus the force of gravity. Notice we're dropping the vector notation. We'll, later on, we'll always substitute positive numbers. We're putting the direction from the free body diagram. Now you have to ask yourself, is this object moving up or down? No, it's not. I told you it was a horizontal circle. So there's no up or down uh, y hat motion change. So this would be mass times zero acceleration, that's zero. So that means tension Y is equal to the force of gravity or mg. And oops, let me put the positive sign here. All right. And positive tension X is equal to mv squared all over par. mv squared all over R. Well, now the thing you've got to look here, kids, is where is that theta? Because we've got to start breaking down tension X and tension Y. Well, kids, the theta is right in here, remember? Well, let me show you the diagram. Look, see? Theta 
theta. So there's your theta right in there. So take a look at this. Tension x is opposite to the theta. So this becomes positive tension, right? The whole vector sine theta all over mv squared all over r, right? And then tension y, well, this tension y side is adjacent, so it becomes positive tension cos theta mg. I think, I hope you see where this is going, right? Because remember, we want to find the theta. So I'm going to call this equation one, this equation two, and we're going to divide the two of them. We're going to divide the two of them. So we've got positive tension sine theta is equal to m v squared over r. We're going to draw our dividing line and then positive tension cos theta is equal to mg. And let's see what cancels out here, right? Well, tension cancels, mass cancels. And then I hope you realize that sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. V squared over R divided by G is the same as V squared over R being multiplied by the inverse or V squared over R times one over G. So we get V squared RG. And remember, we want to find theta. So theta is tan inverse of V squared all over RG. Have you seen something similar to this before? I hope you have. Think about it. So there's this section. Okay. Have a great day. Bye-bye.